Greetings. Uh, it's really a privilege to have the opportunity to talk with you this evening. This uh, South Carolina Study Center really looks to be like an exciting initiative in the community here. It's been really fun to see all the really cool things that Richard does. We've corresponded over email for a couple of years now, I guess, and so it's been really fun to meet Richard in person and to see this, this really neat organization that I hope we'll have we at Davenant will have a long and fruitful fellowship with over, over many years in the future. I've been invited to talk about the theme of my, my recent book, Bulwarks of Unbelief, subtitled Atheism and Divine Absence in a Secular Age. I've decided to get at the whole of the argument through the piece mentioned in the subtitle, Divine Absence. And that will be our, our theme then for this evening, the theme of divine absence. Immediately, of course, there is need to specify the question. To, to mention divine absence in the abstract evokes many possible associations. Most fundamentally, we might think of all the where are you lords of the Psalms and the whole history of Christian lamentation. Uh, the typical context in which we tend to speak of divine absence when it comes up in the abstract is just the, the apparent silence of God in the face of human suffering. Uh, when our life or, or circumstance feels like one big scream, the apparent silence of God can, can feel particularly deafening. <laughs> but this evening I'm exploring a different sense of divine absence. Perhaps we'll, we'll have occasion to return to the first one, and perhaps there's an argument to be made that this second one I'm going to explore is a species of the first one. But whatever the case, the sense of divine absence that I have in mind this evening, evening is something more like divine non-obviousness, or more properly, the, the feeling or sensation that God's very existence is not obvious, or at least not as obvious as one thinks it should be. Said differently, we're not speaking of God's absence from this or that potential action he might have taken, but rather of God's absence from everything altogether. Failure to act is simply an implication of failure to be, an evidence not of divine caprice, but of a divine vacuum. Of course, in contemporary stories, these two senses are often found together. That is to say, God's, God's failure to show up in suffering wakes the soul, the modern soul, you might say, to consider whether or not there's a God in the first place. Um, I've often invoked this film with uh, Liam Neeson, if you've seen it, this film called The Gray that was made 10 or 15 years ago, uh, to get at how we tend to put these themes together uh, in, in this film. Uh, it tells the tale of these kind of rough oil workers whose plane crashes in the Alaskan wilderness. And they're all chased by wolves, these very aggressive wolves. Uh, as that happens, each of these oil workers tend to, uh, tend to turn to religion or to some su sort of supernatural hope uh, as nature picks them off one by one. Uh, but not Liam Neeson's character. Uh, I, I didn't look up the name of him, so I just call him Liam Neeson's character in this case. Uh, uh, he isn't critical of the others, but he, but he himself has long since stopped believing in God after the death of his wife from cancer. All he sees in the world is nature red and tooth and claw. And toward the end of the movie, he's, he's the only one left and he's crying out to God to do something, you know, up in the sky. And he's met with total silence because nature alone speaks and is reality. The burden of my recent book is to account for why this is such a natural association for many of us. That is, why is it that divine silence is such a powerful argument for divine non-existence? It does not seem that this association was common for our ancestors, but it is for us. It, it would seem that there's some shift in our imagination that must account for why we make this association and they didn't, or at least didn't typically. And this, this helps us to specify the question of divine absence just to click more then. It seems plausible that the experience of divine absence comes to be associated with a divine vacuum at precisely the moment that God seemed discardable from the cosmic picture in the first place. That is, before suffering can be felt to bottom out in atheism, God has to seem non-obvious in some base, more basic way. The fact that my, my former lover's the lover, lover uh, ignores my texts, after all, doesn't mean that she doesn't exist. He or she, I'm not speaking about myself, uh, just an analogy. <laughs> she, she doesn't ignore my texts, uh, anyway. Uh, <laughs> but when we're talking about divine absence in the contemporary period, we're talking about a sensation that God could be far more obvious than he is. 
And it is this that elicits the crisis of unbelief for a lot of people. Um, now, you as an audience will either sympathize or not sympathize with me when I make these descriptions, and that's okay. Uh, and most assuredly, whether you sympathize with the things I'm saying or not, or you can hear yourself in that, that description, uh, that is not to be confused with the difference between the righteous and the wicked, just to, just to get that out of the way. But minimally... If this isn't you, what I'm describing isn't a kind of sensation you, you sympathize with, and there could be lots of good reasons for that, uh, that might help you sympathize with and minister to, those, uh, to others who experience the world this way. Um, for some people, the sensation goes something like this. Sure, there are lots of arguments for God's existence, and sure, I can ruminate them over and over, but in all of these cases, cases in all of these, this memorizing of arguments and counter-arguments for intelligent design or reading arguments and counter-arguments for or against the you know, classical theistic proofs for God, etc., I feel as though I am holding on to belief in what is supposed to be the most basic of things by an act of will. And isn't that weird? It doesn't require some great act of will to believe, say, that we're in South Carolina or that I'm talking in this room right now. Whatever we're all supposed to feel about those things, whatever's supposed to be obvious, whatever my epistemology demands theoretically, I find it fixedly and immediately impossible not to just believe whether I like it or not that I'm in this room. I do, in fact, like it. Uh, but, but for many, belief in God simply just doesn't feel that way. And that's curious. And again, that can be a crisis. Is it supposed to take a great deal of effort to believe in the existence of God? Is there supposed to be a mental tick in our consciousness that finds no comfort in arguments which can always be reworked, where all possible arguments for God are automatically grayed out as maybe an argument for something else? Especially when you feel that you're a mere mortal and cannot possibly work through it all. This basic sensation can re render the whole horde of apologetics texts, but possibly a growing library of evasive commentary on the ornamentation of the emperor's clothes. The more complex your apologetics apparatus, perhaps the larger your house of cards, the more areas open to exposure, and the more, rather than the less, instability one can feel. Or at least that's how it can seem to somebody caught in the pangs of doubt. Shouldn't it just be simpler than that? I've often uh, told this story before, but at the, at the height of my own struggle with this sort of question, I was in uh, RTS, Reformed Theological Seminary in the DC area at the time, and I was uh, on my way home from work listening to NPR because uh, I was told that would make me a smart person. Uh, anyway, there was a, a radio show on highlighting a story about this kind of agnostic or atheist junior high camp. Uh, Christians have all sorts of Bible camps, and so there's atheist camp as well, apparently. Uh, in any case, as the story was presented, they, they interviewed one of the camp's attendees, a, a bright-sounding young woman of, of 12 or 13 years old. And after a little back and forth that the interviewer, the, the camp attendee, was afforded the opportunity to, to present one of her skeptical missiles. And it went something like this. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, mind you. Uh, you know, God could totally get rid of atheism if he'd just show up. I mean, think about it. How hard would it be for the Almighty to peel back the clouds at 3 o'clock every day for God time and say, hey, guys, here I am. See ya. If he did that, no atheism. So why doesn't he do that if we're supposed to believe in him? Here's another one of those two kinds of people moments. Uh, either something in you feels the sting of that or you don't. Maybe it's a bit embarrassing, it's such a campy argument, but it pings something in us that gets at just the point. Wouldn't it be easy, presumably, for God to be so much more obvious than he is? If life and orientation are dependent on believing in him, then why in the world wouldn't his reality feel more obvious? To get at this cluster of questions I've raised, uh, I'll spend the bulk of the lecture unpacking three things. So now a little more structure here. First, I'm just going to br briefly tell the story of modern atheism and divine absence and, and hypothesize precisely when and why they became associated. Second, after absorbing this story a bit, I want to revisit the question of divine absence and provide several responses to the, all the things I've just described. And then third, I'll conclude with a brief reflection on what it might mean to rediscover the living God in an age tempted by ideology. So first, the story of modern atheism. Second, responding to divine absence. Third, believing in God after ideology. 
So first, this, the story of modern atheism. It's a common impression that there have always been atheists lying around in religious communities. Uh, maybe they didn't have their day in public and didn't have much social power to express their views or some such. But there's you know, kind of a trope of the so-called village atheist who's always been that pesky voice at the coffee shop in the background trying to keep us superstitious folk honest. Uh, in point of fact, while there is debated precedent for atheism in certain schools of Roman philosophy and perhaps in at least one school of Hindu thought, there is not a great case to be made for a sprinkling of village atheists throughout any area of Christendom prior to the 18th century. This is not plausibly accounted for by the fact that such atheism would have been persecuted if it were public. All sorts of heresies proliferated in Christendom and they were persecuted. And the fact that atheism wasn't one of them suggests something more plain, that it just wasn't felt to be much of an option. It was no more of a living option to a person in the Middle Ages than the claim that all things, when you really think about it, are just spoons. Everything comes from and reduces back to so many spoons. That's, a, that's about how a claim like that, I think, would have landed in the Middle Ages. The, the, the history of explicit atheism in the contemporary West is instructive in this regard. From what I've been able to gather among historians of the question, uh, we can essentially count on one hand the amount of unambiguous atheists or metaphysical materialists prior to the middle of the 18th century. By the time of Diderot and Holbach in France, I'm not a Francophile, so uh, if I pronounce those names wrong, I apologize. Uh, by the time of Diderot in France in the 1750s or so, it's a position held even then only by a small portion of European elites. And it grows among this class for a century or so, especially um, left Hegelians in Germany, for instance. But it really isn't until the middle of the 19th century. Uh, most historians of unbelief argue this, but uh, it's not really until the middle of the 19th century, in the latter portion of the middle of the 19th century, 1860s to 1890 is usually the, the date most people point at. It's not till then that you actually begin to see a critical mass of atheist free thinkers and skeptics in Western countries. Interestingly, there is literature claiming that this is the, the crucial period of development for England, France, Germany, and the USA. Uh, it's not insignificant as well that the, this critical mass represents the growth of unbelief among especially the urban working classes. That, that tends to be where you see the, the critical mass emerge. Uh, so a history of unbelief in the West must see the middle of the 19th century as of epochal significance. For various reasons I won't get into here, one might argue that the, the period between 1860 and 1960 represents the migration of unbelief to the suburban middle classes culminating in the civilizational crises of the 60s and all the religious fallout since then. But, but for now, I'll stay focused on the latter portion of the 19th century. Charles Taylor, in his seminal A Secular Age, likewise identifies this period as the crucial moment in which atheism becomes possible. Uh, my own book is a, is a riff on Taylor's description of bulwarks of belief. Uh, uh, that's, a, that's a phrase Taylor uses to identify that set of factors in medieval civilization that rendered basic belief in God or the supernatural all but humanly inevitable. To speak of bulwarks of unbelief then is to speak of features of the post-industrial and late modern world that render belief in God inevitably relativized. Of course, no small part of Taylor's own narrative, for those who've read A Secular Age, uh, is attempting to account for bulwarks of unbelief as well. Um, uh, but his account is mostly focused on the modern moral order. For Taylor, belief in God becomes discardable when it becomes a threat to the modern moral order in the calculation of some middle critical mass of persons. Taylor is not wrong. However, um, and here I speak with fear and trembling, it's only because like he's not here that you can say, but I'm gonna say something different than Charles Taylor. Uh, 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 I argue in my book that his account is limited. I argue that we need to account for why God seemed eradicable from the world picture in the first place before he was eradicated for moral reasons. Uh, to be sure, I don't think Taylor would disagree with that, but it's unclear to me that he sufficiently accounted for the discardability of God. Why did God come to seem like only a hypothesis? How did he come to feel editable from the cosmic picture? Part of what I'm trying to do in the book is supplement Taylor's reading with a hypothesis about why this, why this particular period is so significant. So here's the basic hypothesis and then we'll unpack it in just a bit. Um, not only is the middle of the 19th century marked by the world-shaping impact of the Industrial Revolution, 
But the 19th century represents the climax of a centuries-long migration of many European workers from a subsistence existence to wage-earning existence in an urban center. Uh, these are, of course, related phenomena. Uh, as many historians have pointed out, this, this significantly transforms that, that whole nexus of events, significantly transforms the relationship of humans to their labor, to nature, to one another, and indeed to their, to their very own selves. Uh, in the book, I use the term technoculture to describe the way in which technology, labor, culture, and life come together to re-script our relationship to the world. Uh, it is in this transformation, I argue, that we can discover why anyone became tempted to, um, uh, uh, to treat God as a hypothesis who might or might not be out of a job. Uh, very briefly, uh, uh, I didn't put this here, that's also the period in which we begin to speak about modernity, uh, seculariz secularization, uh, you know, uh, uh, and um, disenchantment. And so it's interesting to ask the question of like why, you know, you know when did we become disenchanted? Well, when did we become secular? Uh, when, do we, when we speak about modernity versus something before modernity? And one answer that some historians or cultural theorists give is something along the lines of, we can speak about those things at the same time as humans begin to self-describe in that way. And so in this same period where you see atheism become possible, that self-description uh, of one's own civilization and context uh, likewise rises. And those are all related phenomena. And I, I, some of that's in the book for those who are interested. Uh, at the risk of excruciating brevity, I'll just spell this out by contrasting pre and post industrial life in an admittedly Sunday school fashion. Uh, so let's ask the following question. Uh, what did reality, community, and my very own self often seem like in the, in the mirror? I'm going to use that. We're going to use a lot of the metaphor of the mirror. Seem like in the mirror of a classical subsistence existence? And then what did the world, what does the world, my community, and being a self progressively feel like in the mirror of a post-industrial existence? Uh, here we're not asking a question about what one, or one might or might not think about reality but about how reality, my community, and myself appear, manifest naturally and inevitably to a person. Consider a pretty normal character in the history of humankind, a male or female farmer living in a smallish community subject to the seasons and only in a certain degree of control over their circumstances. A storm which we might watch indoors with a kind of sentimentality right here uh, would, might for them be a threat to their survival. In general, such persons are in an extreme state of dependence on the activity of one another for a coherent existence. Moreover, it is not a simple affair or even possible most of the time to exchange one community for another. Much of life is fixed and determined, and indeed it must be in order to survive. If you fail at certain tasks, you will suffer very severe consequences. So getting back to our question, what does reality seem like in the mirror of that kind of existence? In short, it seems like an agent. It is a fixed actor upon me against which I have to navigate. I'm in a delicate exchange with its many movements. The world is a chorus of communicators rather than an amalgam of machine parts. When I attend to and experience plants, trees, rocks, weather, stars, soil, water, and the whole universe is a set of actors upon me, what does the whole cosmos seem like in the mirror of that gaze, of that engagement, of that experience? When the universe is full of agents through and through, when it is natural, then, oh, excuse me, when, it, when the universe is full of agents or felt to be full of agencies through and through, then it is natural to believe or just to assume that it bottoms out in some agent or agency in whom all, as one man said it, live and move and have, our, have their being. But that's not all. The fixed experience of a community, even when it contained negative experiences, was nevertheless an experience of agents in their agency. Humans are direct actors on me, and I am a direct actor on them. This is not just a theoretical knowledge about human agency. I cannot help but be in an attending relationship to this fact and to feel it profoundly and prominently. Likewise, the experience of my own agency and even the meaning of my agency would shine very prominently in this existence. And that's not to sentimentalize it. It might have been terrible in a lot of ways. But why I'm doing what I'm doing was very clear. Even if labor is hard and monotonous, I know exactly why I have to do it. Because if I don't, I'm going to die. And so will my family. 
Moreover, I know exactly what part I play in the tribe and even see very directly, uh, again, not sentimentalizing it, but see very directly how I plug into the social order and what the significance of my particular action is within that social order. What is reflected in the mirror of this experience of our communities and ourselves? Not only is the world a collection of agencies, but our community is a collection of agencies, and I am in conscious, agentic relationship to each. There is no world, no community, and no self that isn't an actor among things all the way down. And so all of reality from all directions is naturally felt to bottom out in an actor behind all act. This is not first a philosophical hypothesis, but an obvious fact that is naturally read off the very page of every texture of reality. Perhaps this first actor is silent, and perhaps I may struggle with whether he is good, but his sheer thatness is delivered as the very ground of every actor in action in the world. And we'll come back to that. For now, let's contrast the picture I just painted with the way in which reality feels, uh, you might say, uh, to those who have been shaped in the epoch-making cultural textures of, of late modernity. Moving in the same order, life in the city, and especially in suburban contexts, progressively evaporates the ways in which our ancestors felt the self-assertion of that natural order. In the book, I, I try not to focus on modern technology in the abstract. It's not, a, it's not meant to be a Luddite screed or something like that, as though technology is an actor in itself. But I'm really trying to talk about how we've used technology and reshaped our imagination with it in the book. And here I'd argue that we've used it in a way that makes it hard not to forget certain realities at a practical level. I can move through space at thousands of miles a day with little obstruction. Uh, electricity brackets day or night, it's daytime in this room. Uh, food chains disconnect me from either the plant or animal origins of food. All of these realities exist, of course, and we know that, but they're hidden from my attention and my dealing with them is outsourced. And even if one is, you know, even with that theoretical awareness, our practical relationship to the world remains this very modern one. My experience of the world is one in which the world self-assertion has been irreducibly numbed. And, and, and crucially, we don't just choose to relate to the world this way. I think this is a really crucial point. We don't just choose to relate to the world that way, but we're rather born into it. You inherit it. It's part of the basic fabric of a social life, for a lot of people at least. Uh, the agency of the world somewhat bracketed, what of the community? Urban and suburban existence are marked by that increased independence of life, or to put it more poignantly, by being able to have such independence as an option. One can still have community, of course, but you don't have to. It becomes increasingly possible to have fragmented and isolated human contexts and to live in one's own home as in a private country. You add social media to this with my ability to friend and unfriend, and we can likewise experience our community as a passive and agentless collection of personages to whom I can elect or refuse to be in communion. And yet presumably that still leaves the agency of the I. Presumably our own agency is left alone in all of this. Isn't this the age of the self and of self-actualization? Perhaps rather it is the age of desperation for a self that we cannot seem to self-create. Self and meaning and human agency have always developed against the backdrop of a concrete world and circumstance and alongside other agents in a common project. Subsistence living just is that irreducibly. You can't not live like that. Uh, but it's a long observed character of modern labor, not all labor, but a lot of modern labor, that it frequently loses the kind of immediacy to my life and community that helps labor seem meaningful. In much post-industrial labor, it's common not to be quite sure what I'm doing within an assembly line of human activities, even sometimes in white collar jobs, even in well-paying jobs. Uh, many feel carried along, you might say, in their own life, even in their activity. They kind of feel like a passenger in their life. All of the products and services which we seek, to, which seek to therapize this suggest that we haven't quite figured out what's wrong with us, why we don't know what we want, who we are, or what we're doing. To return to our question then, what does the world look like in the mirror of that kind of experience of the world? The agency of the world somewhat numbed over, the agency of the community silenced, and our very own difference making grayed out for us, it is not surprising that the cosmos only feels like a more of the same 
in this fun house of foggy mirrors. It is silence all the way down. And so in what, in, and so in what does such a reality bottom out but an abyssal silence, non-agency at the very bottom of being? And so in my judgment, it seems that divine absence begins to suggest atheism precisely as the whole show on a human register might begin to feel agentless. For the reasons just surveyed, I argue that this develops among those raised in a post-industrial urban context and then migrates to, to other contexts thereafter. Before moving on to my second point, a, a brief qualification, uh, for reasons that I'll highlight in a moment, none of this is an argument for nostalgia. That's very important for me to be very clear about. There is nothing to be gained in wishing to be from a previous age uh, or for being too cynical about our own age. I'm actually, I don't feel very cynical about our age. God has placed us just here and now, and our pressures are simply our pressures, an adventure and task placed in front of us to be nav by God to be navigated as he equips us. So uh, we'll keep that in mind as we go to this next section of the lecture, and then we'll conclude with a few reflections. Okay, so we've, we've told one story of modern atheism. God disappears from our gaze in precise, in precise proportion to the manner in which the world, our communities, and we ourselves disappear to one another. These plot points in place, that's way too much alliteration. Uh, let us secondly then go back and stare at the issue of divine absence, considered in itself, and see if we have gained any orientation. Uh, I'm taking it for granted here, just a, as an aside, that there is intellectual proof for God uh, and that whatever it means to become more deeply persuaded of God isn't, isn't about psyching ourselves out to feel like God is real again, but rather is more basically about attuning ourselves to realities that we have bracketed from our consciousness. So I, 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 and so I take it for granted even that the proofs can motivate us to, 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 to regain that attunement. Um, let's respond then to the sensation of divine absence in two steps. The first is something I developed in an earlier little small book, Enduring Divine Absence, that Richard mentioned. And the second one is something I developed in the more recent book. So, uh, uh, so response one, recapitulating earlier thoughts. So perhaps a thought goes like this, just to remind ourselves, even if there is some formal proof for God, maybe it can be argued that on some register, God could be more obvious than he is for we lesser mortals who can't always read Thomas Aquinas or understand him. Uh, <laughs> Let's interrogate what's behind this impression, however. Let's say for a moment that God is not as clear as he might be. We'll come back to that. What would be the advantage of him being clearer? There seems to be the thought sometimes that if God were only a bit clearer, we'd somehow be different. But this can ignore a very special sense in which God, like, like Heraclitus' description of nature, loves to hide in some of his acts. This is not out of caprice or cruelty but rather because God has made us historical and dialectical creatures who grow through time. And it is precisely through this history and dialogue that he engages man and becomes more present to him in some ways. God does not just place man before the fullness of his presence. Man isn't born with the beatific vision in the old theological mumbo jumbo. But rather the fullness of God is to be found at the end of a fully realized human project. The human race grows into the fullness of a bride ready to receive her husband in biblical nomenclature. Even in the garden, it is portrayed that God was uniquely present on some occasions more than others. There's a kind of coming and going theme of God in the garden. Not in his being, he's totally present in his being, but in his covenantal presence. After the fall, uh, uh, at least for Christians, we believe, God's revelation of himself is piecemeal but is punctuated by the same dialectic of presence and absence. He speaks, and then he's silent, sometimes for, for hundreds of years. And even in the final word of Christ, our Lord ascends. Christ comes, does all these great things. He conquers death. He ascends. He com or comes out of the grave. Yay, he's here. And then he goes away. Uh, <laughs> right after the resurrection, he ascends. And his bodily absence is mediated by the gift of his spirit who grows us to his full stature. What does this amount to? God postures himself, or possibly it amounts to saying, God postures himself in his clarity precisely in proportion to his purposes in revealing himself. And it is decidedly not his purpose to always be clear in the way that we ask for clarity. Even Christ himself frequently hid his identity uh, 
according to his own purposes. There's all those texts in the New Testament where Christ is like, don't tell people who I am. <laughs> and you're like, why? Why is that? Very interesting. And crucially, the, why? You know, God's purposes in revealing himself. Part of the background for that might be this following observation. Uh, crucially, the results of, on, not that I want to speak for the Lord's motivation, so uh, hi, hi, I'm hypothesizing here. I don't want to be blasphemous. Okay. Uh, uh, the results of unambiguous divine presence are not what we might think. Old Testament Israel, the New Testament church, and the Middle Ages are eras of, are not eras of unambiguous faithfulness. The so-called enchanted world where God is very clear to everyone is not one suffused with civilizational maturity and good Christian homes and organic co-ops and just really decent folk. Uh, <laughs> in some, when we're wishing that God was more obvious, it is crucial to ask what we, we actually think this would get us. In our case, it would not be surprising if God insists on hiding his obviousness behind a non-pathological relationship to the entire cosmos. That is, perhaps he expects us to figure out that we're crazy on this one. Like a good parent, he does not hold his own ways in civilizational captivity to the malframing devices that, that we've inherited and that we bequeath. He loves us and is ever present to us, but it is we who are disoriented, not him or his creation. Perhaps, indeed, he wants us to simply, as the uh, Gen Z tells us, to touch grass. Uh, this leads to a second answer. In one sense, it is true that God could make his presence felt to be obvious on more registers than he does. However, there are aspects of reality where God cannot be more obvious, even in principle. Coming to see this is the kernel in my judgment of what can amount to a philosophical conversion for a lot of modern people. Like if you're sitting up at night worried that we're all in the matrix, this is for you. Uh, <laughs> in point of fact, perhaps if we're asking God to be more obvious than he is at the most basic cosmic level, we're just misunderstanding what the word God even means and we're asking for an idol. Consider our atheist friend from camp earlier in the lecture. Let's play out the thought experiment. What if God pulled back the clouds at 3 p.m. every day, Monty Python style, uh, you know, and, uh, and, and said, you know, had God time? Put your sci-fi hat on for a second. Is that the kind of action distinguishable from the kind of power that is attainable by some advanced consciousness? Uh, you know, Zelensky's Lords of Light, 60s sci-fi novel that some of you might have read, plays out a thought experiment where people do something exactly like that, but it's not anything we would call God. Mix a little AI and transhumanism together, and you can generate a lot of entities that aren't far off from what most people imagine to be God, and you could extend the analogy. On the premise of atheism is the complexity of our whole universe and any exercised power imminent within it, not possibly reducible to the simulations of a quantum computer one layer up. In fact, this is a growing hypothesis at major universities about our whole universe. And here's what it reveals to us. When we use the word God, we're often imagining a very large creature. <laughs> we think of God as one discrete object among other objects, some perhaps much larger thing that stands out among the other things. But what if God is simply not like that? What if, in fact, that is to desire the presence of an idol? In the classical view of God, it is not even thinkable that God could be unambiguous to creatures such as ourselves in the sense that this would demand, or said differently, I think this is a better way to say it, He's, his being is already as clear as it could possibly be on any possible, uh, I'm sorry, uh, his being is already as clear as it could possibly be on the register we're demanding. As the old tradition has it, we really do know God through creatures, through creation. While we know God as a supreme person, it takes the whole canvas of the created order for God to speak himself. And human knowledge of God is the retracing of God's existence and nature through the things that have been made. God is the supreme artist in whose being we have our being, in whose existence we and everything else stands above the abyss of nothing. The being and perfections of God are discovered through discovering things that have been made. And to make the point clear, there is no other option. 
That's not an option among many options in the classical view. There is no other way for God to reveal himself. Why? Because creatures are not God, and God is not a creature. <laughs> but creation is a revelation of God's being and life. His ever-present and personal, that creation is a revelation of God's being in life, his ever-present and personal action in things. So you don't want to imagine, you know, God created and then there's this floating ball and he goes over here. Uh, well, well, we'll clarify that in a second, actually. Uh, even, God's even God's revelation of himself in scripture, in theophany, like the burning bush, and in the incarnate word, remains a revelation that is taken up from creatures. The human nature of Christ is a, is a created nature. What this amounts to is that there can be no other argument for God's existence to creatures such as ourselves than creation itself. The creation cannot contain the creator, but it can reveal something of him, or rather he can reveal something of himself in it to the soul. We'll come back to this by the end. Before we move on, it's crucial to note that the intimacy, that God's intimacy to the created order is deeper than any intimacy in that order. Uh, smart people get bottles of water that are just this size. Uh, I, I'm learning, so uh, thank you, Richard. For... <laughs> I didn't buy it, it was given to me. Uh, it's not as though knowing God through creatures makes creation a sort of a layer between ourselves and God. We don't want to think of it that way. No, creation just is a kind of intimacy with God that is actually quite unimaginable to us. The creation is suspended so intimately in the act of the creator that the creator can be said to be closer and more intimate with and more interior to creaturely realities than those realities are to one another and to themselves. To claim that God exceeds all objects of the mind is not to remove him from contact with us, but to recall to an intimacy, to, but, but to be recalled, or to recall ourselves, to an intimacy of presence that is more profound than our distant idols. And here's a way to test that. You remember the shack comes out and everybody who's moved because it makes God kind of intimate and he cares about our problems and the image of kind of this our incarnate person, that sort of thing. Why is that, why is that a, you know, if we were to say there's something heretical about that book, you, know, you don't have to argue about it here, but let's, let's, let's say we wanted to say the book was heretical. Why? One of the responses is, well, it brings God way all, all the way down here, right? God's really way over there, and he's big, and he's majestic, and he's powerful, and all that sort of thing. And there we've brought God over here, and we've made him a creature and sentimentalized him. Let's not talk too much about feelings. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's heresy for the exact opposite reason. It actually gives God the distance of a creature rather than the intimacy of creator. You're not thinking of creation right if you're thinking that's the solution to God's distance for you as a, as a creator. The, the intimacy of creation to creator in the classical tradition is a very, very, very profound piece of human, human reflection. Let me uh, offer two thoughts by way of conclusion. First, if I, could, if I could leave anybody with anything tonight, I think it would be an encouragement to detect when our solution to these problems uh, when our solution to these problems becomes ideological. Maybe in the Q&A we can talk some about ideology and what all that means, but when so many reality signals feel blocked for us, and one could, one could give a very similar lecture about the contemporary world of disorientation from gender. I think those are very, these are very related phenomena. Um, it's easy to imagine that returning to reality is discovering the right set of ideas, a system in our heads, and then to directly enact, enact that algorithm as though this is what it meant to do orthodoxy and orthopraxy. To be sure, the arguments for God are very important for us. I wouldn't be the same without them. And they are in many ways especially important to the disoriented. But these are no substitute for that attending to reality and especially that attending to people in our lives and communities that breaks some instrumentalizing posture toward reality, toward being in a more subterranean way. It's in that getting out of your head actually, in that life of love, that we're out of our heads enough to, to see the whole of reality as it really is, as a revelation of God's life to us. It becomes a living texture again, you might say. The life of the mind can motivate this, but love does not reduce to an event in the mind. Moreover, the mind itself remains disconnected from reality to the extent 
that it does not draw from the deliverances of loving attention to the world and the persons that God has made. Second, at stake in remembering the intimacy of the creator to the created world is the very meaning of Christ's incarnation. When we sing, let earth receive her king during Advent season, the very basic assumption is that Christ's entering into our world is not a matter of colonization by a foreign ruler. Rather, the world was made for Christ and finds its telos in him. It is also where God most takes up the created world, assuming a created nature like our own unto the person of, of the Logos. Here God gives us his embrace in the very textures of a common nature with us. Already present with us by being our creator, God takes hold of the temple of Christ's body and makes of his whole life a created icon of God's whole life and a pattern for our whole lives. Many have been shaken from their materialist slumber by meeting the earth's king and realize that they have entirely misunderstood the kingdom, for it is no materialist kingdom. Others come to see that kingdom, that, that the kingdom that they inhabit, the world they're in, isn't some cemetery occasionally punctured, punctured uh, by something that, or punctuated uh, by something that might be alive, but is rather living through and through and begin to long for the kingdom's absent king. One could go on to talk about walking with this king as our elder brother and how the Holy Spirit mediates God's presence to us in the textures of a whole life lived, but we'll forgo that for now. I think that's enough to talk about for this evening. We can talk about some of that in the Q&A, but that's all I've got. Thanks. Mm -hmm.